Hello, everybody. Hello. Hi. Let's all just settle in. We're ready for the next session. And so just before we get into it, I'm going to ask you to take a deep breath. <laughs> Taking a deep breath. Well, some people are still moving around, so I don't know if they're doing that. And could you also just inch closer, actually, if you're at the back? Yeah. Okay. So he says you need to have at least one person next to you as you take your deep breath. Is that, is that, have we, have we organized? Okay, great. So up next is a fantastic guy. His name is Bilal Khalib from everywhere, <laughs> a GMC Catalyst. And he's going to tell us about, um, he's giving us a very thought provoking question. What will we make when we can make everything or anything? So Bilal, over to you. Hey, thanks. So I was really serious. Please get close to somebody so that they're, they're close to you. And if you are comfortable with um, holding hands with that person, uh, that, that's even better. So we're, we're going to get to that pretty soon. Um, so my name is Bilal, and for the last few years, I've been helping share the idea that you can make anything you can imagine. And this is one of the uh, tools that's becoming available for more people to take the things in their heads and to make them real. Who here has like kind of experienced what people are calling the DIY or the maker movement and feel like more capable to create, right? There's some people here, right? This is the attitude that I'm trying to share, especially in the Middle East. And so a couple years ago, I went with a crew out to, uh, sorry, this is Cairo, and I met up with these fine young gentlemen and I got donated MakerBots. Who knows what a MakerBot is? What is a MakerBot? It's a 3D printer. Does anybody know where it came from? Uh, yeah, the basis of the MakerBot came out of the RepRap project, which came out of a university, but the, ma the, uh, the MakerBot came out of a hackerspace, which is a community space where people are sharing resources and tools. NYC Resistor, okay, he's got the right idea. This, 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 this heckling, I, I encourage the heckling. And so, yeah, this thing came out of NYC Resistor using um, the open source platform that RepRap first created. And so they, they donated it to Egypt because um, they wanted to help inspire more people to create. And so I've been working on this kind of stuff for a while. And it's really, really exciting to be able to look into the future and see your hand in creating it. But after working in the Middle East for a few years now, I'm beginning to realize that some of the things that we're creating have nothing to do with the environment in which we're creating them. And I'm gonna suggest something today that will hopefully get us to engage in creating uh, things that make sense instead of just creating stuff. And to do that, I would like you to hold the wrist of the person next to you. Oh, I should probably close that. Um, if you could please hold the wrist of the person next to you and c connect to the person's pulse. Oh yeah, here we go. Let's No, I'm going to switch back and forth. That's fine. Yeah. And we're going to do this for 30 seconds. Has everybody got it? Does everyone know how to do this? Oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry, thank you, thank you, thank you. That's crazy, right? It's crazy. I got you. Has everyone got it? Yeah? Not if you, you found their pulse. Good? Okay, so now take a deep breath. Okay, so that's the heart, okay, that beats inside of all of us. And this is the thing that I think can transform the creative potential that is being developed within the maker movement, within the DIY movement, within the open source movement, and let us see that we can create beautiful things in the world to support each other. And so it's making from the heart. I know um, everyone has something that they love, and this is my niece. She's uh, four. She's really cute. And this, this picture is simply a segue <laughs> because I love my niece. <laughs> and I'm gonna tell you about a couple of projects that I did that I think got a bit ahead of themselves. They weren't very grounded, I wasn't very thoughtful. And so I'm gonna show you a couple of these projects and then I'm gonna show you some more projects that I think are really, really inspired. So the first project is um, my cousin Zaid. He's an amputee because um, you know what? I'm going to close that. Uh, he's an amputee because in uh, Iraq, during the sanctions, there was a period where it was hard to get uh, 
diabetes um, medication. And so Zaid lost his leg, and I was really getting excited about the community space that we were developing in Baghdad called Fikra Space. And so I thought to myself, like, what if we started using these tools that we have in the hackerspace to start like, solving a problem? And I, I was thinking tools first. And so I drew on Zaid's leg with some marker, and then I used an application called 123D Catch to scan his leg, and I turned it into this, prost uh, this prosthetic positive cast. And I learned from my friend David Senge, who made multi-material prosthetic sockets, which are basically the basic premise is if you put hard stuff on soft stuff and soft stuff on hard stuff, your prosthetic becomes comfortable. So bone into squishy, muscle onto hard. And then your socket becomes something that you can stand in. And so I wanted to replicate that using some DIY technology. And here's us in Baghdad with uh, Saleh Zain, who is a wonderful kid. Oh, he's like 17. Saleh, I hope you hear this, because I just want to say that you're, you're awesome and that I'm really proud of everything that you're doing. And so he and I were working on this with the rest of the Ficker Space crew. We made this wax mold, and we um, slipped it onto Zaid's leg. And it was kind of cool. I mean, it really did address some of his uh, problems. But in the end, the thing that turned out to be the most useful wasn't making the 3D model. It wasn't making it fit exactly the contours of his leg. It was pouring it into a baking tin and then cutting the strips and putting it onto his leg so that he had different durometers of silicon, different hardnesses on different parts of his leg. And so, you know, maybe got a bit ahead of myself there. And if there's somebody recording, this is just because I, I don't like to talk about projects in a negative way in public, can you please just like stop the recording and uh, stop this other stuff, please? Just a little bit. Okay, and so there's another project where um, people started hearing about this work that I've been doing and taking DIY technology and taking it to places of conflict and working on trying to address some issues. And this guy reaches out to me who's somewhere in California and he says, I want to go to somewhere in Africa to help create prosthetics for uh, this person. And it's a very specific individual, very well branded, very well marketed. He brought like one engineer and then four cinematographers. And so I started to feel a little strange. But um, the really exciting thing was like at that time, I met up with this guy named Richard. And Richard made this thing called the Robo Hand. And the Robo Hand is this 3D printed prosthetic hand. And Richard is awesome, okay? So Richard, uh, is a, was a carpenter from South Africa. He chopped off a couple of fingers during an accident, and he's like, you know what, I can fix this. Because he heard about 3D printers, and he got really excited about them, and he started like printing iteration after iteration, and like model after model, and he found a really wonderful way to make a prosthetic hand. And so when I was first there, I got super excited. I was like, dude, Rich, this is awesome. I want to learn how to make this hand. I want to take this to that some place in Africa and help people by like making prosthetic, like a hand prosthetic lab. And so I spent uh, uh, a couple of days with Rich and the team, and we developed this process, and we used this orthopedic plastic, and we took all these DIY approaches to making these prosthetic hands. And then we called the person and the doctor at the hospital there. And you see, I'm putting string in right now. And I was like, hey, um, we need string. Do you guys have string? And the doctor was like, no, uh, no, no, no string. I was like, okay, 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 fine, fine, fine. You must have fishing line, right? Like, people must fish. And he's like, no, no, no fishing line. I was like, okay, okay, well, how about fabric? We need fabric so maybe we don't have to bring all the orthopedic plastic with us. We can use fabric and epoxy. He was like, no fabric, no epoxy. And then I started realizing that the problems in this place <laughs> that I was going to, to hopefully set up a 3D printing prosthetics lab, were like way, way beyond the couple of people that were amputated. And we were not using an important part of our body, which is um, this part. So I think that project did address the first part, the heart, right? It was at least trying to pull on the heartstrings of people to motivate them to donate, to work, to act. And he definitely convinced me. And I was on board. But um, it took me a couple of days into it and a lot of convincing from my friend to realize that I should also be using my head. And so there's this wonderful thing. It's called a logic model. And a logic model is a strategy for making sure that the things that you do connect to your heart 
but actually address the things that you're trying to address. You know, you can get really excited. Who's here has been excited about a project and just like got so absorbed in it and just like kept thinking about it and doing it and working on it? Okay, that's a really great state to be in, but sometimes it can be dangerous because if you don't really pay attention to what you're doing, you might get ahead of yourself and start working on things that you didn't really expect to be working on. And the logic model is the cyclical thing. You can see there's an arrow going down and then all the way around and then back. So um, I don't know if I put in an example, but basically you'd start with an example and then you try to model the world. And then you say like, what do I want to do to address this model? Let's say that your model is smoking, right? You're like, I want people to like stop smoking because it killed my uncle and I'm really passionate about this. Smoking killed my uncle. And I'm really passionate about this. Don't smoke. And Seriously, Geraldine, don't smoke. Okay. And I want to I wanna find a way to solve it. And so you, you model the world. You say things like, I want to make an anti-smoking campaign. This, this is going to be great. We're going to do a Twitter thing, and we're going to make sure that people tweet about not smoking. And then uh, you figure out what the outcomes are, like how are you going to monitor it, and then you figure out the effects, and uh, you keep going back in this circle to make sure that what you're doing addresses the stuff that you're working on. And so this stuff that we were doing at Ficker Space with the prosthetic socket stuff, I realized not that one, was not necessarily the, the thing that we were looking to create. And I just wanted to show this quick video. Oh yeah, the really goofy, goofy music. But uh, lower the volume. But the thing that really was happening at Fikr Space with all these projects was that these cuties, these awesome little Iraqi dudes were like getting together and setting up a community space where they were um, looking beyond their differences into a future where they can be productive and creative with each other. And so this is a really nice video. And what I really love about this video is uh, this is a visitor to Fikra Space just talking about how much he uh, likes it. He made this little documentary tour and he's talking to some of the founders. And I don't know if you notice, but everyone is like 16, okay? Um, and they're sitting on like playground equipment. And the other thing that I love about this is all of the comments. This is a video that has 470 views and has like a ton of engagements and a ton of comments from people in Baghdad and around the world being like, yeah, go Fikra Space. And so uh, this, is, this is one of the real positive outcomes that I think came out of the, the hackerspace. Um, another thing that is really trying to connect people to their best selves is my friend Murtada did this awesome workshop uh, called uh, a, a Dream Workshop where we went to Fikr Space in Baghdad and everyone said what they dreamt to do and we went in a big circle and everyone tried to give the resources that they had to help the other person accomplish their dream and then try to give them their email addresses and contacts so that they can stay in touch. Okay, I guess we can start recording now. I, I was as vague as possible about that thing, um, but if you'd like to record, now is, now is fair game. Okay, and so this over here is Ali. This is, we're gonna go now to Beirut, where there's a community space called Lumba Labs, and we're gonna show how people are taking this DIY stuff to feel something and then to act on it. So Ali was a homeless person in uh, Beirut who everyone kind of knew. He was a fixture, he, literally like a fixture. People would kind of walk over him as they walked to class or kind of pass him by. And Shortly after this picture was taken, he died. And you'll see also on this one picture, there's a lot of engagement. But what I love about what these people did in Beirut is that they used a tool that you might be familiar with, um, Ushahidi. And they took this open source tool, they customized it, and they started making this thing called Find Ali, Invisible No More. And I'm gonna try to find uh, Ali. And each of these little nodes is actually a searchable database of people putting up little snippets about the, the, the homeless people that they see in the streets to make sure that they're not invisible no more. And so one of these links shows that um, there's two old homeless people under the Coca-Cola bridge. One has been there for two years. The second been there has been there for a year or less. Every day when I'm heading to work, I see a two homeless men sleeping under the Coca-Cola bridge. And so instead of having this thing be invisible and not talked about, just by making this website, they're like raising up awareness and getting people to have a conversation about these people. And this is one of the really great uses of open source software that's coming out of the Middle East. I think it's a, a really wonderful thing. Um, <laughs> okay, so 
I used to work sort of thoughtlessly in Baghdad. I was just like, hey, I want to bring in like 3D printers. I want to make sure people are gathering together and like playing and working. And one day I was in Baghdad and I really wanted to go out to the hackerspace because we had a workshop. And then there were car bombs. And so people were like, yeah, don't worry about it. <laughs> You know, like, if you're stuck at home... Oh, so they blew up the guards around my house, and so they locked off the entire neighborhood. And the figure space people um, were just kind of blowing it off like it was nothing. They were like, you know, it'll probably be open up again at 4 p.m., and we can do the workshop then. No problem. And I was like, oh, yeah, no no, 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 no what? It's a problem, and it's a, it's a real big problem. And it started to affect me more and more. And so I uh, I decided to start taking some of the open tools that I had available to me to, to just do something. I didn't really know what to do. And so I started calling them art projects. And I learned from AB14, uh, the Aero Bloggers Conference, uh, some data visualization stuff. And I thought it would be a great idea to try to let people know how bad the, the problem was in Baghdad. And so this is a really quick processing script. When you run it, it creates the square that changes with the size of the number of people that have died. And then I worked with uh, Murtaba in Baghdad uh, to create this video, which, um, which just takes the, the audio file, and then every time there's a car bomb, I don't know if you can hear it, it plays a beat, and then the entire city gets a little bit more glitched. And so the, the fast version of that sounds like this. So try to imagine that each of those hi-hats is a day. So every day that goes by in Baghdad since the Americans pulled out sounds like ta 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 And then every day that there was a car bomb, um, we made a drum go off. And the amplitude of that drum is the number of people that died. So like a little, drum, a little beat means that only six people died, and a really loud beat means that um, 60 people died. So now tell me that that's not a problem. Tell me that mafi mushkila, just wait in your house and then come out when you can. And this is really what changed my attitude about what we should be using our tools for. You know, like I like Uber, it's great. I can pull up a phone and get a cab and go somewhere. But I would prefer there to be no more violence in the countries that are um, where I'm from. And so to encourage that, I'm hoping to highlight a couple of these awesome projects. Another really funny project that I'm taking on is, uh, so that's historic data, right? That's people in the past uh, that have been blown up. I want to make a real-time representation of that. And so uh, I'm writing some code called WeAware, which parses the Twitter feed and finds events uh, that could be car bombs and validates them with a volunteer team. So people say like, yes, there was a car bomb today and it sucks. And uh, the idea is to make a, a interactive sculpture where every time a car bomb goes off, uh, <laughs> a sculpture that represents the history of Iraq gets turned one turn. So it gets crushed slowly over time. Um, so another project that's come out of Beirut is Heida Ra'ina. This is a really great project where uh, people are talking about like civil liberties and internet activism and sharing that online. The violence in, uh, in Lebanon uh, sometimes is referenced as people dying in a, as a martyr. And people started getting pissed off. And so they started this social media campaign called, I am not a martyr, okay? And they wanted to point out that the, by calling this thing a martyr, they're sort of justifying the causes that are at play in causing the violence. And they, uh, they started putting up pictures and tweets and hashtags. And I think that more of this kind of stuff should happen, more conversation on social media, more kind of artworks that talk about uh, the violence in the Middle East is really needed. And you can find that kind of stuff at Hey Dara Ina. One of the other really great projects that came out of Beirut is, whoops, uh, is this thing called uh, the Lebanese Elections Data. This is really awesome. You have to play with this tool. Okay, so Mark, Maya, and some people at the, the Leban Lebanese hackerspace started this project um, 
and they, ah, uh, yes, let's see. And so you, you go into this website, and which one do you want to see? Let's see voter trends by confessions. Voter trends by confessions is awesome. Green means that there are more uh, registered voters and people voting in this country from this sect, and red means that that sect has pulled out from that district and there are less voters. And so this kind of invisible thing that is um, happening in Lebanon is now made visible through this um, D3 <laughs> uh, uh, representation. So you'll see that here there was a, um, uh, an exodus of Sunnis, it's red, people have left. And if you switch over to the Shia, you'll see that it turns green. So that one district is transitioning. And you can see what happens with the Maronites, you can see what happens with the Druze, you can see what happens with the Greek Catholics, and you can also pick your years. And they do all sorts of things. This is a really important one. So white and invalid votes. This is how Lebanese people protest their governments um, and still participate in the elections. They go and they put in white ballot votes. And this is the representation of the districts in Lebanon and how many people have been um, not voting, basically, or voting with a white ballot vote. So this is another great project um, that was uh, worked on by some of the members in the Beirut hackerspace. And because you can't really have a, a talk about the internet open source culture without cats, I, I found this cat in Tunis. There's also a turtle. So turtles are my thing, cats are your things. But, you know, here's a, here's a cat. Okay, so now let's get to a place where we're a little bit more uh, using our hearts and our minds. This is a project that Fikr Space is working on. Um, this is Ali and there's Ahmed. That's the Fikr Space, Hacker Space. This is what it looks like in Baghdad. It's pretty dusty. And... Uh, there was this doctor in the south, or sorry, there's this, this guy, it was just a father, but his son got cancer, and he wanted to know why, and he started doing his research, and it appears that there's like a problem with depleted uranium. There's a lot of like speculation that this material that was dropped in excessive amounts during the Gulf Wars, both of them, uh, like 1,400 tons, like that's really heavy, I don't think I could pick that up. Uh, was dropped all over the country and in great concentrations in Basra. And he helped set up an organization for cancer research or ca uh, cancer assistance for parents to know how to treat their children and also for uh, getting medication for the kids to have a school to play in. And when he met me, I had brought with me this device, which is a SafeCast Geiger counter. So here's, here's that thing where we realize that we have the capability to create and solve our own problems. This came out of, who knows what the SafeCast is? Okay, who, you want to explain it? Oh, Don, okay. You want to explain what the SafeCast is? Exactly, so it's a device, it's a Geiger counter, and this is a, a, a GPS sensor from, I think, Adafruit, and this is a data logger from SparkFun, and the Arduino is the platform as the back end, and so that's an open source microcontroller. And after the tsunami in, J in Japan, uh, the Tokyo hackerspace, Sean Bonner, people internationally as a part of the open source and hackerspace movement got together and made this really quick uh, device that they were able to distribute faster than the government was able to. And they were able to give people data that can keep them safer faster than the government was able to. And when I was going to Baghdad, I ran into Sean Bonner, and I was like, dude, Sean, I need, oh sorry, I was going to Erbil. I need this device so that I can like, start investigating the problem of, of radiation in, in the country. And so I met up with Leith, the father of that kid who got cancer. He saw this device, and we decided that what we really need to do is do a tour of Basra and uh, take two surveys. One survey that maps the population where they got sick, and the other survey which maps um, the areas that are really affected by radiation. I discovered a lot of things about conspiracies and radiation mapping and some of the challenges of working with uh, data, and I can, I can talk about that later if you'd like, but um, the project is now turning into an open data project so that everyone that has ever run a study in uh, Iraq on depleted uranium, and on radiation and on uh, adverse health outcomes, so like birth defects and cancer, we're encouraging them to share their data so that we make a 
make some clarity around the situation, which is currently very unclear. And so here's the Ficero space um, playing with the radiation monitor, learning about how it works, and we're hoping to take them down to uh, uh, Baghdad, oh, sorry, Basra to do the monitoring. Wow, I had less time than I thought. <sighs> so this is Katya. This is why I've been having a bit of a rough time. Um, Katya is in a refugee camp, was in a refugee camp in Syria, and I was there last summer. And uh, I just want to show like a really quick video of her because she's super cute. But uh, my friend Abdurrahman went there. And he, uh, he did some workshops with them. We were thinking about alternative education spaces in conflict zones and in refugee camps. I had a really hard time when I was there. I thought I was going to do something, and I got overrun. It was a really, big, like, really big challenge. Um, but last week, uh, Katya and her friend were killed when the Syrian government dropped um, a missile on her on her school. And so that was really bad. And there's something that I wanted to do. Some I wanted to do something about it. My friend and I were already working on this project. It's called For the Dead. I was thinking about commemorating the people that were lost in Baghdad during the sectarian violence, the thousands and thousands of forgotten people. And so we made this website. Uh, most, of, uh, most of the website comes from my friend Joe. Oh, where's For the Dead? That's not it. Uh, I guess I have to... Ah, oh, here we go. So For the Dead is a website where you can commemorate the people that have died with a good deed. And it's down which sucks. Oh, no. Yeah, it's done. Oh, oh, that's it. That's it. Okay. So um, these are some of the people that have died. This is my friend's mother who died in Afghanistan during the hotel shooting last uh, month. This is my uncle who died because he was smoking. Geraldine, that's my uncle. He's dead. He smoked a lot. Um, and this is Katya. So you click on Katya and you have the ability to commemorate her with a positive action. There's this concept of sadaqa jariya, which means continuous good deeds. And so we're, we're trying to create a website where people can um, do positive actions for people that have died, whether or not they died in violence. And I think this is a really great way if you can all like help in commemorating Katya. I don't think we're gonna be able to stop the violence in Syria as much as we like, but uh, even just being kinder to each other, I think, is a really good way to remember her. And lastly, um, I guess what I really hope is for us to see what people are doing with these creative tools and like the tools that we have available to us and use the stuff that's happening in the Middle East and in Africa. I have examples from Africa too. I didn't, didn't share them. And share them with the rest of the world. And so this is a really quick project. It's called For the... Uh, sorry. It's called uh, Lebanon Would Be Better If. Started by Sharif. And he just went around really DIY, low-tech, grungy, spray paint on the wall, say, Lebanon would be better if... dot dot dot. And he encouraged people to put up their ideas, and it's Lubnan Yikun Ahsan. And what I find really amazing is that this project um, is now international, and it's called Project Better. And that's what I want to see. I want to see the Middle East, Africa, and all of these places that are having really serious challenges take all the increased capability for creativity and production that's being produced by the open source movement at large and show leadership in like, wonderful things that we can do with them. And I wanted to have this be more of a discussion, but I guess I spoke slower than I normally do. <laughs> so I'm sorry. And that's all. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.